It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to Israel and United States, Allies in the Fight Against PTSD, a Doctors for Israel conversation with Judy Isaacson Elias. The program will be recorded. Now, I turn this program over to Seymour Reif. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're at. My name is Seymour Reif from Scottsdale, Arizona, even though it looks up there as if I'm in the north of Israel in the Hula Valley during bird migration time, a, a great place to visit. I'm a proud member and past president of the board of the Desert State of the Desert State's Board of Directors of Jewish National Fund. I'm on the Arad Task Force and I'm the new National Doctors for Israel Chair. First and foremost, I hope you and your family are healthy and well during this continued challenging time. We are so grateful to those of you in our healthcare community who have been and continue to be on the front lines in fighting this pandemic. We are honored to gather on Veterans Day to highlight and discuss the mental health challenges our US military members face in battle and at home and how organizations like Jewish National Fund and Heroes to Heroes are providing life-saving services to combat post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the things that makes the U.S.-Israel relationship so special is not only our shared values, but also our shared challenges, which bond us even closer. For years, terrorists from Gaza have traumatized the population living in neighboring communities along the Gaza-Israel border, placing thousands of people's lives in danger and causing many to seek safety in shelters. The fires and damage sustained have had a tremendous impact on the mental health and livelihood of those who call the region home. Thousands of acres of farmland have been scorched, decimating the region's agricultural economy, and the number of individuals experiencing and being treated for PTSD has increased. Jewish National Fund USA has been on the ground in Israel to support these communities affected by terrorism. In addition to funding trauma resilience centers, the JNS Deirot Indoor Recreation Center, animal assisted therapy in the region, JNF is also planning to add new bomb shelters that can each house 100 people, paint bomb shelters already in place to make them more child friendly, provide new fire trucks and firefighting wagons, purchase life saving equipment, and fund special activities for children of the region. Before I welcome today's guest speaker, Judy Isaacson Elias, I would like to share special remarks with you from the mayor of Sterot in the Gaza envelope, Alone Davidi. Hi, boys, and all the people uh, that are living in the United States. This is Alon Davidi, the mayor of Sterot. I'm standing here in the Croatian room. Like you see, we have all the screen that show us all the camera and all the area in the road and why we so why we so busy with this situation because the terror that uh, continue to come from Gaza just in the last uh, months we find a, a new uh, tunnels that the Hamas digging in the ground because they want to continue to send people from Gaza terrorist people that come outside uh, very close to the road and try to kill us and kill the citizen of the road you remember, the road is not a base of army, it's not a base of soldiers. It's an area of citizens, almost 30,000 people that want to live like in all the world, normal situation. We want that the peace will come and we want to live like a normal people. And because of that, I want to say again, thank you very much for all your support. The JNF of the United States, all the people that support and uh, and the love is the road and know that the road is the front line against this terror that come from Gaza, against the Hamas, against the Jihad and ISIS. And because of that, I want to say again, thank you very much. We continue to do, to building the uh, the, city. the, uh, the resilience center that help us to deal with all the people that suffer from the PTSD, from the post-trauma and especially in this emergency time of the corona because many of the people need to stay in the house and besides they have a lot of problem of psychological problem because the post-trauma we see that they have a more problem because of the corona so thank you very much for your support and we hope that everything will be okay 
Our Doctors for Israel Society is proud to support this important work and honored to partner with organizations like Heroes to Heroes, who bridge the US and Israel in the fight against PTSD. It's now my privilege to lead us in discussion with our guest speaker, a woman who is devoted to helping those who have served our country. She's an experienced professional who is the Northeast Regional Manager at Regional Reps, a firm representing more than a thousand small and medium market radio stations. She's a dedicated leader who has been actively involved in the Bergen County Women's Political Caucus, Teaneck Township Financial Advisory Board, Wounded Warrior Project, UJA Federation of North Jersey, and Congregation Beth Aaron. And she is a passionate public servant who was the founder of Heroes to Heroes, an organization that honors the service of all veterans in the United States, especially those with extreme PTSD. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome an inspiring woman, Judy Isaacson Elias. Thank you, Seymour. And thank you all for being here. Judy, thank you so much for being here with us, especially on Veterans Day to discuss your incredible work. I'd like to start off by learning more about you and why you founded Heroes to Heroes. Thank you. I'm the daughter of a World War II veteran. My father served Second Day Normandy, Battle of the Bulge, and he was one of the liberators of a concentration camp. My father never came home. He came home physically. Uh, he wasn't able to finish college. I uh, just could not concentrate, couldn't focus. Uh, he managed to get an engineering certificate and I never felt I was lacking. But I learned later that he went from job to job. When I was 16 years old, uh, my family was pretty dysfunctional and a lot of it due to his PTSD, which didn't have a name at the time. And uh, I ran away from home. I was doing drugs. I was drinking. And uh, I decided that I'd rather move into a friend's family than stay in my family situation. Uh, but I stayed in touch with my father. And at one point, he called me and said, Judy, I need you to do me a favor. He said, we were able to find a way to send you to Israel on USY Israel pilgrimage. I really want you to go. And my first reaction was, I want nothing to do with Israel. I want nothing to do with being Jewish. I can't deal with it. It's too, it's suffocating me. And he said, Judy, would you please do it for me? Now, I don't know how many of you have are men with daughters, but our daddies are our first love and I couldn't hurt my dad. And he had never asked me to do anything for him. And I said, I'd go to Israel. As we were walking in Jerusalem, and I don't remember at what point of the trip this was, we were told we were going to the Kotel, the Western Wall. And I just, I broke down and I said, you know, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be here. I've rejected God. I've rejected Judaism. I, I'm not worthy of this. And my friends in the group said, do it, just go. And it tears in my eyes, crying hysterically on the way, walking through the old city. And it's still hard for me to talk about many, many years later. Um, and I, I put my hand on the wall and it changed my life. I realized I wasn't alone anymore. And I realized I had a greater purpose and I had to find out what that was. I reconnected to the Jewish people. I reconnected to my people. And when I returned home, it's, I'm sorry about this, but it's no matter how many times I tell it, it's tough. Um, when I returned home, I started keeping kosher and getting involved in Jewish things. Went back to my family eventually and found a way to be there. And then fast forward to 2001, my father, passed away as a result of a car accident on, and when he was 81 years old on the way to a Jewish war veterans meeting. And I spoke to one of the, the, his fellow veterans and they said, you know, your dad volunteered every week to help wounded veterans for the last 20 years of his life. 
and I had no idea. And they also said, we were kind of surprised that he lasted this long. And we always thought he'd choose the time and place that he would go. And I said, I didn't understand what they were saying, but I asked him, what does that mean? And they said, well, your dad never, never came home. He had PTSD. I said, what? He said, you know, he would kind of go in and out. He wouldn't even tell us what he went through. And we had all been there. Okay, and that stuck with me. And in 2009, I was invited to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And I met our soldiers. And what I saw was so much pain and so much fear. And so many of our soldiers said, I don't wanna go home. I wanna go back to Iraq. I wanna go back to Afghanistan. And as a mother of two sons who did not serve, I said, I don't get it. These are our children. They're all our children. I have to do something. And I started volunteering for Wounded Warrior Project and some great things and then some things I didn't like. But then I started seeing, we have 22, at the time, 22 suicides among our veterans per day. We're not making a dent. What's going on? We're taking them on vacations on R and R from a lifetime of R and R. They come home and they're back where they started. And it triggered something in me. And I thought back to my 16 year old moment and going to Israel, reconnecting. I said, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's a connection with Israel. I want to do something for Israel as well. Israel saved my life. So I started studying suicide. And what I found was there's a strong connection between faith and survival and how important that connection is. And that's when Heroes to Heroes was founded on, in March, 2010. And it, it's what we do is we provide spiritual healing and peer support for veterans who have attempted suicide or on a path to self-destruction due to PTSD with a focus on what's called moral injury that is now finally being discussed in veteran, veteran circles. And it's now becoming more as part of the PTSD discussion. Judy, from your perspective, what do you think most people get wrong about veterans and PTSD? Well, I think veterans have a different, have many different issues. The number one thing I think people get wrong is they think PTSD causes them to be violent against other people. From what we've seen, most of the violence we worry about is with themselves, is that suicidal part. Also veterans have a different issue and it's again, bringing up moral injury. I think it's very, this is crucial to understanding PTSD with veterans because it's part of the PTSD, but we do isolate it because it's handled differently and traditional therapy makes no dent in it. Uh, so what it is, moral injury is caused by doing something that is abhorrent to your psyche or your moral code or your ethics. So what we're doing is we're asking these young men and women to go to war. Their job is to kill. That's what war is. And we don't really talk about that aspect. We say they go to war, they come home, there's an IED, blah, 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 the easy things to talk about. But when they go, they're killing people. And in some cases, they're asked to not pick up a baby from the ground. They're asked not to give, not to help a child who may be begging. Uh, in one case, we had a, one of our female veterans was riding in the back of a pickup truck and she saw this young Iraqi boy on a bicycle. And she saw that the bicycle didn't have, didn't have brakes. And the child kept riding into the perimeter and he was unable to stop. And he was warned a couple times. And she was trying to say to the security officers, leave him alone, he's okay. 
he doesn't have brakes, but the kid got too close and he had to be eliminated. Okay, and that was a young boy and that boy died in her arms. When we were sitting you know, in Jerusalem and she told us the story and she said to me, she said, you're a mom. She said, he died in my arms. I didn't scream loud enough. I should have jumped off the truck. I should have, she said, that's all I think about. And that's the moral injury. And that's the part of PTSD that a person who's had a car accident or God forbid the poor children in steroid, that's the part that they do not suffer from that our veterans suffer from and our veterans will not talk about. So, you know, they tend to be, we have a suicide rate now of 20 per day. They tend to be violent just toward themselves. Brain injuries and other things may cause and severe anxiety, which, you know, it, it's all bundled into the same thing. But that moral injury makes it very, very different from PTSD from other sources. Very interesting. Judy, what are some of the current best treatments that you have seen for PTSD? Okay, one thing I've learned is every person will swear by something else. Okay, so EMDR, some people say, wow, that's helped me. Others are cryotherapy, others are, there seems to be, you know, just a mix of different things and it depends on the person's personality. And for some people, nothing works. Um, one thing I've seen that's more consistent and is our therapy dogs. You know, of course I believe spirituality, you know, but with our program too, there are many people who this, they're not open to this. They're not open to this route. They may not have a moral injury, but therapy dogs seem to be the most helpful and not necessarily even therapy dogs, but dogs having that companion, a big challenge people with PTSD have is they pushed every single person they love out of their lives. So they're alone. And if they're, you know, lucky or blessed or gifted with an organization like ours, and there are many great organizations out there where they develop a new team of veterans and they have go-to, that's helpful. But having some, something to take care of and something to love and give them unconditional love seems to be the most helpful. You know, there's an organization, Pets for Patriots. What I love about them is they encourage veterans to adopt dogs who are in shelters because most veterans don't need a therapy dog. They need a dog, they need a companion. So that seems to be the most helpful, you know, because it's 24 seven. You know, people love to go ride horses and it's, it's great therapy. At the same time, you have to leave your horse with the dog. It's wonderful to have them home. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of that because I see that's more universal. So. Why did you choose to bring uh, groups of PTSD veterans on missions to Israel? And what can we learn from Israel's approach? Okay. Um, you know, I guess this, this question has some, I have a selfish reason because I'm a Zionist and I want everyone to love Israel. And part of my reason was to have a totally different group of people who I believed would connect with Israel, have them as advocates in the United States, which has, you know, through our university program or, you know, JNF on campus, we, uh, we do a lot of work with that. Um, but a lot of it came back to my reconnection with my creator and finding that peace. And Israel is the only place we can do that. Uh, our program is focused on two things. Number one, spirituality, reconnection, and helping them find that forgiveness. So part of that moral injury is they can't forgive themselves for what they've 
done. So how do you, so the first thing they do is say, well, I can't go to church. I can't go to my mosque. I can't go to my synagogue because, and this is based on our surveys and the research being done on the organization. 80% of our veterans will say that God wishes they were dead. So to start on that premise, if you are a believer and that's what you believe, you've got to make that happen or you've got to reconcile it. So what we help them do just by bringing them to Israel, that task and they see, one guy wouldn't put his shoes on. He said, I'm on holy soil. I want to feel it every minute. And he's the same person who said to me, I don't, I'm not worth it. Don't take me. But then he said, you know, if God didn't want me here, I wouldn't be here. And when we start hearing that, that's where the healing begins. And they realize they can have that connection and they can find that forgiveness. So Israel was a natural. And all that Israel offers, we have um, Israeli veterans who travel with us. And they become kind of like they're grounding. So most of our veterans, when they come here, they think Israel's war, they think it's Iraq or Afghanistan. And then they, they see a very different scenario, but when they're greeted by their Israeli buddies who they've already met online before they go to Israel, there's that security. Hey, here's this guy, he's just like me and he lives here every day. And they become helpers. So also helping, they help each other. Many of the Israeli veterans suffer from PTSD. Having that connection together where they share, they share their experiences. Our veterans will say, wow, this, they call Israel a vet country. They say, look, 70% of those people, they're veterans, they're just like me. From night number one, they can sleep all night because they know the doors are locked and 70% of the people in the country can take care of them. They no longer have to be the guard dogs. They don't have to be guarding. They're, they can sit here and go, someone else has my back. They have my six. I can just relax and enjoy. Uh, one guy said to me, Judy, this is, like, this is like Disneyland for a veteran. We have everything we want here. All these people understand us. This is the greatest place for us to be. They, you know, one guy said in one of our films, he said, you know, I'm in Israel, I'm home. So it's just a great match on so many levels. There must be many, but can you share a few of the most memorable, memorable moments of your missions to Israel? Wow, oh yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with Stephen. And uh, Stephen, Stephen's father called me in tears saying, I'm gonna lose my son. Your program is exactly what we believe. They're, you know, they're Christians from uh, South Alabama. And our, he was from Arkansas, not Alabama, from, from Arkansas. And he said, this is the only program we've seen we believe will help our son. Well, we kind of, our coaches got on Stephen and we finally got him to go. But his father said, if he dropped him off at the airport, Stephen wouldn't get on the plane. So Stephen's father drove from Arkansas to Newark, New Jersey to put his, spot, his son on the plane. And Stephen, beautiful young man, 26 years old, so sad. And he said to me, he goes, I hope, he goes, I'm, I'm the crazy guy in my town. So, you know, if I, if I seem crazy to you, that's normal. So we get to Israel and at one point we got to Yad Vashem, uh, the Holocaust Museum. And as we, just as we left the children's area, Stephen said, I, I need to talk to you all. And he gathered us and he said, I'm gonna tell you something because I learned something here. And he said, the first thing I learned was, I'm a soldier, I'm not a murderer. And then he told us this story that when they were in Iraq, his team was ambushed, he was a ranger. And one of the insurgents had a weapon trained on his, his battle buddy. 
and he had two seconds to decide whether he took out the insurgent and saved his battle buddy or took chances. And he made the right military decision and took out the insurgent. Well, the insurgent was 10 years old. And Stephen said that since that day, that child and the other 50 people that he eliminated during his four deployments visit him every night in his sleep. And he said he can't sleep more than two hours a night that are broken up. And he said, I'm 26 years old. I can't do this for the next 50 years. And he said, but one thing I learned, I'm not a murderer. And the next day the team went to Bethlehem and we had a pastor go with them. And it was the first day Stephen was able to pray. But the real turning point was when we went to, to plant trees that thank you JNF, because this has saved so many lives. And Stephen planted a tree in memory of that young boy. And after he planted that tree, that was the first night he was able to sleep. And right after tree planting, he opened up, he started flirting with the Israeli girls. He started telling his story to everyone. And today he run, he's a manager at a vitamin shop in Oklahoma. And he's my personal, you know, making, he's making sure that I stay alive. But his tree planting was so crucial. And, and, you know, we laugh about the trees. He said, we're not trees. And I said, yeah, but trees for our people are everything. Uh, and then another story that I just love because special in uniform is one of our favorite places. And uh, we don't leave Israel without a special in uniform visit. And one of our veterans, we, we went to special in, you know, we, our typical stop in and special in uniform and it happened to be Purim. And we came with all kinds of, we were teaching them about Purim and we had a Purim party for the soldiers of special in uniform. And one of our veterans just, broke down and he said, you know, he said, I need something like this for my child. This inspires me. He has an autistic child. And he said, I'm going to get involved with this. This is my thing. I know that my child now can use his skills. And I know my child is valuable. And he said, just being here, I now know how to speak to my child. He said, I haven't been doing the right thing, but special in uniform taught me parenting and he said now he said i'm going to go back i can't wait to spend time with my child and i can't wait to help my child reach his full potential and he said that's a big stress for me he said i thought it was my fault because of what i did in iraq and it all came together for him at special in uniform and oh boy, we have you know another story with Harrison Manyoma, who Harrison was came home on August twelfth, two thousand and twelve, and drank a bottle of vodka, took all of his pills, took out his weapon, loaded his gun, wrote a note to his kids, and said, "Sorry," he said, "Sorry, you guys are better off without me." You know, I'm, I'm no good for you. You don't want to see me anymore. At least here you'll get, you'll get whatever little money I have, but I won't be a burden to you anymore and I won't embarrass you anymore. And he put the weapon to his head and he was about to pull the trigger and the phone rang. And it was two coaches from Heroes to Heroes who had just gotten his name and as to be recommended for our program. And they said, you know, Harrison, you've been selected to go to Israel. You've been referred to us. And he said, what? He said, what's in Israel? He said he had, you know, he'd heard of it as like a little problem on the map. And they said, look up heroes to heroes, look up Israel. And he said that when he saw it and he saw that it was the Holy Land, and he said, in his head, he had said, God, 
show me a sign. And he said, if that wasn't a sign, there were no signs. And he came to Israel with us. He was very angry. He called me all kinds of names. I'm this Jewish white woman who thinks I know what's good for him. And when we were walking to the hotel, we passed a group, you know, God makes things, little miracles in Israel every day. And uh, the first group we see is a group of Falashim from, you know, Ethiopians. And it's their son's bar mitzvah and they're celebrating there's cookies and he says me, they're not Jewish. I said, actually they are. And our tour guide started to explain to him. Well, he walked to the wall and he had had third degree burns on his hand and he wore a pressure bandage and he was in pain all the time. And the way he describes it, described it, he put his hand on the wall and at first he felt nothing. So he just walked away and he had his attitude and he said, and to quote him, he says, this guy who looked like ZZ Top came up to me and said, you need to do that again. And he said, so he turned around, he goes back to the wall, but then his, his anger came back and he wanted to go after the guy. So we turned around and he said, but then there were like a thousand of them and I didn't know who they were, who he was. So he put his hand on the wall and he said, in that moment, he started to cry. He felt a shock in his hand. And basically what happened to him was just a whole change. Uh, he was, he had to pull off his bandage because his head, his hand got so hot, but when he pulled it off, he had no more pain. And today Harrison is our program manager. He works with us full time. He's been to Israel about 10 or 12 times. He has his own LL frequent flyer card on his Israeli buddies. And, uh, he's just, his life has changed. He has his kids very close to him. He's a very responsible parent. And now he has an income and he feels like he's doing the best he can do. And without Israel, Harrison will tell you, he wouldn't be here. Well, Judy, I'm sure we could spend hours listening to your stories. They're, they're just beautiful. And for those of you who, who don't know what Special in Uniform is, Special in Uniform is uh, one of JNF's affiliates in Israel that uh, takes uh, people of army age who ordinarily would not be able to go into the IDF because of mental or physical disabilities of, of varying degrees, uh, takes them in, puts them in uniform, makes them feel like part of society, like part of, of nor normality, uh, lets them function to their ability uh, well in the idea and helps them find appropriate uh, occupations afterwards. It's an amazing organization. Judy, there are many organizations involved in the fight against PTSD. Why do you partner with Jewish National Fund? Well, Jewish National Fund has such I think, you know, part of what I always explain, how I try to explain this to people, number one, you have the same values that we do. It's people first. It's the caring, it's the love. And the love comes from the top in your organization. And that's, you know, we talk in our organization about leading with your heart. And JNF is all about heart. It's all about Israel. It's all about Israel's survival, but it's done with a heart for the people and putting the people first and the people's needs first. And that was, so, um, that's what I felt. And there's a trust that you take care of the people. You don't use your people. And, you know, we're very sensitive to our veterans and their health concerns. And anytime one of our veterans encounters JNF or speaks at an event, they come back and say, those are the greatest people. They're so, they made me feel comfortable, but they made me feel warm. Uh, we have a lot of the same goals. You know, it's to serve Israel, but mainly it goes back to the people. Uh, we had a veteran and, and, you know, this is, our veterans know 
so much about JNF by the time they leave Israel, you know, because their favorite things are 9 11 Memorial. They love that. And so many of the things you've done in Israel are important to our organization and the development of our people. They love going, speaking to a lone wall, to ammunition help, you know, planting of the trees is life saving, you know, special in uniform. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Um, and if we had more days, we'd go to more of your sites. So, you know, with JNF, it's a partnership, basically in so many ways of love and support and strength. And, and I think that's what we, we bring to the table. We get the strength from you very often from JNF people and our veterans start understanding your love for Israel and all that you do and that connection. And it's important for them to see that because it's giving outside of yourselves. The people in JNF are the most giving people and our vets see it and feel it and they feel your passion. And so when they come home and all they wanna do is go back to Israel and talk about Israel, having JNF as a partner, if I put out there, hey, they're having a dinner in Scottsdale and there's a veteran anywhere near there, I'm going, I'm going, can I go, can I go? Because they know it's going to be positive. We have a veteran in Las Vegas, Jessica. And one random night, I get a text from, received a text from Russell with a picture of he and Jessica. I said, what, where did that come from? Well, Jessica was mi missing Israel and she saw there was a JNF young leadership dinner on the strip. It was Israel on the strip and she said, I have to go. That's JNF, these are my people. And so Jessica Vargas is sitting at JNF at a JNF dinner because that you become home to them too. And, and I think that's because of the shared values and again, my veterans know if they go to any JNF event, they're gonna be received with love. And I think that's something that is so special and it's so rare. And it's something that JNF can be so proud of because we don't find it. There are a lot of veterans organizations that we do work with, but I never hear my veterans say, hey, can we go to another event with X? It's always, what's JNF doing? There's, I saw there was a dinner or a breakfast, can I go? So, I mean, I think that's what makes it even more special. And I wanna thank you all for that because we feel it all over the country. Wow, thank you, Judy. You are amazing. You are a real hero. This has been a most insightful and inspiring conversation, and we thank you for joining us. Thank you again to all our participants for taking the time to join us on this first DFI 2021 lecture. Please save the dates for our upcoming programs. On Sunday, February 21st at 10 a.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific times, it's gonna be offered twice to accommodate both coasts with Ali Negev Medical Director, Dr. Itzhak Siavnir, whose topic will be, it takes a village caring for Israel's most vulnerable. This will highlight our work and special needs during Jewish Disabilities Inclusion and Awareness Month. And on Wednesday, June 23rd at 12 p.m. Eastern time, featuring a panel of medical researchers, Dr. Neva Bloom and Dr. Rifki Ophir from the Central Arava R&D Center, Center. The topic will be medical miracles in the Arava. Registration is open and more information can be found at jnf.org slash DFI lecture series. I wanna thank each and every one of you for your generous support of JNF as members of the Doctors for Israel Society. If you have not yet done so, I encourage you to make your 2021 commitment. If you were inspired by today's discussion and would like to get more involved, there are many ways to do so. You can speak with Jessica Milstein, National Director of Doctors for Israel, your local DFI chair, your board president, or JNF professional to discuss ways to help grow your local Doctors for Israel chapter. You can host a virtual Doctors for Israel briefing for your colleagues and healthcare community members. And please invite other like-minded doctors to join you in supporting Jewish National Fund. 
thank you all again for your participation and please do not hesitate to be in touch with me with any questions, concerns, comments, or feedback at doctors at jnf.org. Thank you all very much.